Hi, I'm Dr. John Neufeld. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada. Welcome. Uh, appreciate you joining me today. Um, I'm carrying on this, um, I think it's a fascinating study of the life of David. The man went from shepherd to a great warrior, which eventually led him to becoming king and the greatest king in Israel, and certainly one of the greatest men who have ever lived. Well, today I'm just going to take you to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, which even if you hardly know the Bible or don't know anything about the Bible, I'm going to guess you have heard about this chapter because that is the chapter of David and Goliath. I think everybody's heard of David and Goliath. In fact, it's become um, a metaphor in our culture. Uh, you know, if the individual takes on the big corporation or maybe takes on big government or whatever big something is, we always say it's a David and Goliath-like scenario. So, you know, it's become a metaphor for a lot of things in our culture. David and Goliath has captured the imagination, I would say, of the world. Uh, so let me speak a little bit about that. Uh, it's uh, the longest account, the longest story that we are going to find in the two books of Samuel. Uh, first and second Samuel, and this is in chapter 17. It's the longest story we're going to find. The story contains 22 quotations. 22 times people are quoted as speaking, and that makes the drama of that chapter especially poignant. Goliath himself makes a long speech which contains 33 words. Uh, all manner of details are found in this story. Everything from, well, uh, David comes to the camp of Israel and he's been out on the farm and he's come to bring some food and the account contains the number of cheeses that David brought. Uh, it, it contains the actual weight of Goliath's armor. It, it, uh, in, it indicates the number of stones that David put in his bag as he faced Goliath. So all sorts of incidental details are there in the account. So uh, you might say, why are all those details there? And the answer is because the sacred writer, the, the inspired writer who, who wrote this account for us, wants us to have our imagination stirred so that we can actually feel and, uh, and, and sense the drama that was actually going on. But, but there's more to this story than just that. We're, we're supposed to ask, when we read it and after we've read it, where did the victory come from? I mean, how is it that David ended up winning this victory against Goliath, which seems like you know, a fight against all possible odds? And we're supposed to ask ourselves, where should we put our confidence? I mean, should it be in the things that are seen that scare us or the things that are unseen that are ultimately weighty? So that's what we're going to do in this account. We're going to ask ourselves, what should we actually see in this story? And it'll tell us something about how we live our lives and the things that we look at and the things that we see. Now, like Moses standing before Pharaoh. I mean, you have to imagine that scene. Moses, the guy that showed up from the wilderness, stands before the most powerful man in the Middle East, perhaps the most powerful man in the world at that time. I don't know that with certainty. But he stands before him and says, let my people go. Now, it's a, a fight against all possible odds. So in the real way, that's how we should see the David and Goliath story through that very same lens. This is a story not about against all odds. It's really a story about trust and confidence in God. That is, if God is for us, who can possibly be against us? That's how we should read the account. So let's start with Goliath, shall we? As we begin this account, let's describe him briefly. And I'm going to say that Goliath is described as a man who trusts in the arm of the flesh or trusts in the resources that he can bring to the fight. So we're going to read now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. And here we read, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Succah, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succah and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So that's, you know, that's the introduction to the drama. And uh, let me give you a little bit of context from that. 
Um, Saul is the king of, uh, of Israel, and he has managed to gather the tribes of Israel together into a fighting force, and he's been engaged in constant warfare against Israel's enemies. He's trying to establish a place for Israel to live so that they're not constantly being attacked. Uh, on the eastern side, so if you can imagine a map of Israel today, on the eastern side of Israel is the nation of Jordan. Well, if you can think about that nation today, and then go back 3,000 years, and imagine during that time, it wasn't the nation of Jordan, but there were three nations where the nation of Jordan now exists, and those nations were Moab, Ammon, and Edom. And uh, so that's where the battle was fought on one side. Then immediately to the south of him in the desert regions, he was fighting the Amalekites. I spoke about that briefly yesterday. And then on the western side, what we now think of as the Gaza Strip. Yeah, it seems like nothing has changed after 3,000 years, but there's perpetual warfare when what we now call the Gaza Strip, and it's against the Philistines. They were on the west. They were right along the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, this represents... Uh, King Saul's most difficult military foe. Um, you know, there were, um, among the Philistines, they had five fortified cities. And the cities, and I'll mention them by name, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. And a great many scholars believe that the Philistines actually migrated to that area from the island of Crete, where they originally came from. But nonetheless, they immediately built these five fortified cities that were almost unassailable, and that created a huge problem for Israel. If you go all the way back to the time of Joshua, uh, you have to imagine that Joshua has already got that problem during his time. And when he's actually an old man, the book of Joshua mentions that Joshua says that there are these five cities of the Philistines that Israel was not able to drive out. So they represented a considerable threat, and there was no moving these people. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that Israel didn't have any victories against them. I mean, there is um, Jonathan, the son of King Saul, actually defeated them in the Battle of Michmash. But what happens is then they immediately draw back to their fortified cities where they're again going to be safe and they simply remain there. Now, let me give you a, a picture, if I can, of the Philistines. And I think an appropriate picture, if I were to put it in contemporary terms, think of a group of guys riding Harley Davidsons, and it says Hell's Angels on their jackets, and, you know, and, and they're wearing beanie helmets, and they're looking to cause trouble. Uh, the, the fact is that the Philistines have left behind no writing, and uh, they, they've left behind no architecture or anything of that nature that kind of catches the idea of the, the civilization. They, they were, in fact, you know, to the most part, individuals who were just warriors and a constant threat. So think of them that way. Now, for whatever reason, and the text doesn't tell us why, but for whatever reason, I mean, Jonathan has defeated them at one point in time in the Battle of Michmash. They would have withdrawn to their cities, but now they feel emboldened again. I mean, obviously, situation has changed on the ground. They're again sending raiding parties well into Israel. They're emboldened to enter into Israelite territory all over again. And now the battle line is drawn, and it's about 20 kilometers to the west of Bethlehem. This is where David and his family lives. That is, you know, his, his father, we've, we've learned about his whole family. Um, they live there. And so David has three brothers who are drafted into the military. They're there fighting. David is at home watching his sheep. And um, the battle line is drawn at the Valley of Elah. And it's interesting because archeologists today have actually identified that very valley. Uh, because it's, um, it's got a riverbed or a dry wadi, which only runs with water in the winter time. So any other time it stands dry. So it's a massive depression into the ground with a flat plain, which, um, you know, water will wash through in winter. So that's, you know, it was dry during this time. So that gives you a picture of what's happening. And so you've got both sides. On one side, you've got the Philistines who are standing at one side of the dry riverbed. And on the other side is Israel. And nobody wants to enter 
into the riverbed, because if you do, then you've got to climb up the valley on the other side, and your opponent is waiting on higher ground. So you, you've got a stalemate with the two of them looking at each other. So the, the battle that's about to ensue, however it does, is going to determine for the next length of time who controls the promised land. Okay, let's get to verse 4. It says, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. So you got to remember, Gath is one of the five fortified Philistine cities. So this, this giant comes from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So two things I want you to notice here. I mean, the first one is a technical term. He's called a champion here. And I think that might be a technical term because it would have meant that in the ancient world, sometimes in order to avoid a bloodbath between two armies in which they might have been very equally matched. And so, you know, that you send out a champion. Uh, the champion is a mighty warrior and the other side sets out a champion and the two of them fight each other to the jeers and the shouts of people on all sides. And, uh, and so whoever is left standing, the other side has agreed that, you know, if our champion dies, we're defeated in this battle. So I think that's who Goliath was. I mean, it's quite possible. Uh, he's had these kind of contests in the past. I think it's most likely that he had. And he knows how to win. So he's a formidable man. The second thing I notice is his height. Now, I, I know that, you know, the height that's given here is six cubits in a span means nothing to us, but let me put it in our measurement, and it would make him nine feet, nine inches tall. My goodness. Now, I know that there was a guy by the name of Bull, B-O-L, that played in the NBA for a while, and that guy was a monster. I mean, he was seven foot seven, seven foot seven. And I know also that the, the Guinness Book of World Records you know, that's in our era, right? So it records an American man as the tallest man that's ever been measured in the modern era. And he was, that was in 1940, he was 8 feet 11. I mean, that's amazing. But he's still 10 inches shorter than Goliath. And so it means that the man was immense. Or, you know, if you go back to Numbers chapter 13, when Moses was still around, and he sends spies into the promised land, and they come back and they say, we saw giants there. Now, it's interesting because Malcolm Gladwell, a very popular current author, has a book called David and Goliath. And he starts with the story of David and Goliath. And Gladwell argues that there were some you know, abnormalities, uh, genetic abnormalities that allowed for this kind of person to exist. And it would have come with great strength, but some weaknesses as well. Gladwell argued he would have been very nearsighted in a number of other things as well. Uh, you might be interested in simply reading that account from Gladwell. It's, it's really quite fascinating. And nonetheless, let's continue to read our text. Verses 5 and 6. He, that is Goliath, had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, which is about 125 pounds. That's heavy. And, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And that, by the way, that would, would mean it had a loop in the end and a cord that was attached to it. And his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. That means the spear tip itself would have been 15 pounds of weight. So if he's a huge, strong man and can sling that hard, he's got 15 pounds of weight driving into you. And, and then it says also, and his shield bearer went before him. <laughs> now, you got to be getting some pictures here. And here's the first one. This man is a fortified tank. That's what he is. Uh, you know, it, you wouldn't want to get close to him because, uh, you know, if you got into a brawl with him, that's how you're going to lose. You can't afford that. So you don't want to get close enough to even allow him uh, to hurl his, his spear at you. That's going to kill you. So you're going to try to want to run around him and you want to inflict some kind of a quick lethal blow on him somehow. Maybe you hurl a spear at him or you shoot an arrow at him. But the problem is he's got an armor bearer who's there to deflect any missiles that get sent in. Uh, but also if you get close enough, uh, maybe to stab him, he's got you know this, this coat of armor around him. You do some damage, but you're not going to kill him and you're going to be close enough. He will grab you. 
And once that happens, the game is over. This guy knows the minute he's got a hold of someone, even at, you know, at the edge of their cloak, that game is over and he's going to win. So, so that's the picture you get. It's a fortified tank and you don't want to get close. Uh, now, the other thing that you need to notice here is that there is a detail here that's not mentioned in our text, and it's that the average Hebrew fighting man in that day would have had no armor at all. Yes, Saul, the king, had armor, um, but most of his men, and in fact, m- almost all of the men on the battlefield had nothing. And however, even Saul's armor, the best armor that you had in the land, did not match what this guy had. I mean, this was obviously a technology that was not available to Israel. So let's keep reading. Verses 10 and 11, it says, And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words, the Philistine of the Philistine, they were greatly dismayed. Yeah, oh, Roger Ellingsworth, a commentary, says, uh, this is what his taunt would sound like in contemporary English. Goliath would have said, am I not a pagan, God-hating Philistine? Then why won't any of your men of the living God come and fight with me? See, he's mocking Israel and he's mocking their God. So one thing's very clear. I mean, Goliath is counting on his size, his strength, his military technology. He's counting on everything that you can see. Now, you want to think about that for just a moment because I think most people are exactly like that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I like watching NFL football, and uh, I remember years ago there was a quarterback that whenever he threw a touchdown pass, I mean, he did the whole flex thing, you know, and he pointed at his muscle saying, that's how that got done. I'm just strong enough to make sure that that happens. And, you know, I mean, th- that's clear. I mean, you know, people do that. They boast in their strength. Um, I've said that the uh, David and Goliath story is kind of a metaphor in which you have, let's say, maybe a huge company against a single individual. Well, the company has not one lawyer, but they have, you know, a bank of the very best lawyers, and they are able to give all the time that they need to the circumstance. So again, you're banking on your strength. Um, Let me say this sometimes happens in churches as well. Um, Church leaders all over North America very recently described to what was called the church growth movement, which promised to train pastors in the best business principles so that they grow a church and reach the continent for Christ. That ended up basically as a failure. Uh, You see, human might is always moderated by the power of God. And and I want to get to that. Human might is moderated by the power of God. And that's the question of what you and I can see. I mean, it's very easy to look at, at Goliath and simply say, he's intimidating, he can't be beat. And so individually for us, that's how we approach things. And we say, how strong does my opponent look? So let's apply this passage now from a different angle. What do you do when you're faced with impossible opposition? Let's say you, you know, face a diagnosis that is overwhelming. You're fired from your job. Your financial investments have failed. I mean, what do you do? Do you say, well, uh, I'm not worried about that because those are only the things that I can see. There is an unseen element here, which is the hand of God. And the hand of God is so much greater than the arm of the flesh or the things that I can see. Now, see, if you can get to that in your life, that's what happened. Now, here's the question you might be asking, but is that what David did? Well, let's read our text. So we come to verse 12 in our chapter, and it starts this way. It says, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. Now, you know, some people, critics looking at that part of our chapter will say, you know, that's just restating things. I mean, why in the world are you being redundant right now? We were introduced to David Earlier, chapter 16, now we're introduced to him all over again. And other critics will say, well, you see, what we have here is two different accounts, and they're being squeezed together in one chapter. But but I think all of that's wrong. What we're supposed to see is a contrast. See, let me say it this way. You know, the reason we're introduced to David a second time is because we're supposed to now contrast him to Goliath. Um, We're supposed to 
be left impressed with the size and military strength of Goliath, but we're also supposed to now contrast it with David and ask ourselves this. He's the son of Jesse. He is the, you know, he is the descendant of Boaz. He is among the race of people through whom God had made a promise that he would bless them. Um, Furthermore, we know that is from the tribe of Judah that this one's from, that God had promised that the ruler's staff would never depart from them. We're supposed to think all the way back to Abraham, that God had promised Abraham this land. David represents the invisible promise of God, and the invisible promise of God doesn't look at first as if he's impressive. That's the point. That's the point we're supposed to see. And so under normal conditions, we would think David has no chance but that's only because we are not able to see what's invisible. Now, let's talk also a little bit more about the battlefield that was drawn up. According to the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war. In other words, draft age or draft eligibility began at the age of 20. Since we've already read in our text that King Saul was going about and he was drafting every person who's able to fight, we, we have to assume that it starts at the age of 20. So let's just assume that as we go forward. Okay, so we've got that in our mind's eye, and we know that David has got seven older brothers. Since only three of them are mentioned here, and let's just assume, for the sake of assuming it, because it seems natural to do so, that there were eight boys and they were born one year apart from one another. Remember, there's no birth control, uh, so this is not an unlikely scenario. So if he's got three brothers in the military, let's assume that the next oldest one is 19 and 18. Well, if that were the case, we would put David's age at this point in time, 15 years of age. So let's assume he's 15 years of age, uh, just for the sake of argument. Um, so, you know, he's he's not a man yet, but He's getting there, uh, and he's been out working hard in the field, and uh, he's too young to fight. He's been called upon to care for the sheep. He's 20 kilometers away from the battle line, but his dad is saying to him, look, son, you know, you've got to make sure that somebody, the farmers around here have to make sure that our troops are fed. I'm sending you to the battle line, and you're to take food for the troops. So David shows up. And we find out that Saul, I mean, sorry, uh, that Goliath has been taunting Israel now for 40 days. And, and the tension and the humiliation, the fear and the lack of confidence in God, I mean, it's running all the way through the camp of Israel. And, and David arrives just as Goliath again is cursing Israel and cursing Israel's God. Now, there's a, there's a great many Bible teachers who believe that it's quite likely that David, a young man who was nurtured in the faith, and, you know, he learned the law of God. Uh, he, he believes it's a sin to break the fourth commandment. You know, remember the fourth commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, he's, he's been raised in a godly home. Don't you dare ever misuse the holy name. So it's, it's very likely that David, you know, who's, you know, in his family and among the people of faith, and then, you know, he's out in the backwoods taking care of the sheep, it's very likely he has never heard a single human being cursing God before, and uh, it's 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 quite likely he might not have thought it was even possible. And uh, you know, he, you got to see him with eyes now like saucers, gazing in utter amazement as this you know mammoth fighter stands before him, and he's cursing Israel, and he's cursing Israel's God, and David is looking at that. You see, uh, David would have come to an immediate conclusion. Uh, this man is under God's curse because that's what Deuteronomy 5.11 says, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And from the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, verse 3, we're told that whoever curses Israel, God will also curse them. So David would have come to a conclusion as this 15-year-old kid, he would have said, you know, there's no way this is anything other. That man is under a curse of God. He's doomed. He's going to fail. So David here is a man of faith. He's a man who says the promises of God must be true. Don't care what it looks like. That guy's doomed. So verse 26, and David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, who does he think he is? And, and don't you guys, I mean, what's, what's the king going to do? And uh, they find out that King Saul has already said, look, if anyone, if anyone actually defeats this uh, Philistine, uh, I'm going to give him my daughter in marriage. He's going to marry into the royal family. I mean, he gets, an, <laughs> he gets an immediate upgrade in status in the nation. Now, I don't think that's what's motivating uh, David to do that. David, I, I don't think, has any intention of uh, taking care of that business. He simply wants to motivate somebody else. Number one, the guy's under a curse. Number two, the king's going to elevate you and you're going to be like never before. So isn't there somebody in all of the ranks who's got the courage and the trust in God to step forward at this hour and watch God give you the victory? Go for it, guys. And everybody stands still. And so here's a 15-year-old kid walking among the troops of Israel saying, why are you guys all cowards? Now, Eliab, who is David's oldest brother, hears about what David is saying. He's incensed. He's angry. You know, it's interesting because verse 28, Eliab is speaking and he says to David, I know your presumption and the evil in your heart. Now, the word presumption is an interesting word. It can also be translated as I know your pride or I know your arrogance or I know your insolence or I know how cheeky you are. You're a bratty little kid who thinks too much of yourself. You should go home, do what your dad told you to do, take care of those few sheep in the back acres, take care of that, and leave the war to guys like me. Now, ah, see, that's what he's saying. I mean, you know, so you, know, you got to think that words are erupting here. And uh, but let's remember something else about Eliab. I mean, Eliab is the guy that's rejected by God. That's who he is. And, you know, I'm reminded here of the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. It says, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. So let's take that to Goliath. I mean, the things that are seen are this monstrous man with armor like no one has seen before, with a shield bearer, and he's got all of the weapons of war and probably a track record of having killed one man after another in single-handed combat. This guy is good at what he does. He's a killer. He'll go home that night, and he will not think twice about the man he's killed that day. See, that's probably uh, what you see when you look at him. But what is it that you can't see? Well, what's unseen are the promises of God. You know, what's unseen? God's willingness to defend his great name. What's unseen is the covenant that God has made with Israel that whoever blesses Israel, he will bless. Whoever curses them, he will curse. See, that's what David saw. David saw the unseen. Eliab, his older brother, saw the seen. And that was the difference between these two. That's why Eliab was rejected because all of his life, he looked at what could actually be seen. And by the way, I mean, 99% of uh, human population looks at what's before us, not at the promises of God. You live with the promises of God. In fact, on that note, let me take you to Romans chapter 8, and it's a marvelous chapter, and it tells us everything about the things that are unseen. So Romans chapter 8, and I think I'm going to begin here um, all the way down to verse 31. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us... Hmm? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who is to bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, that's, that's the promise. And those who have faith say, when I look out at the battlefield and I see that there is something that in the seen world is impressive and impossible to stop, that's not where I stop. I stop by saying, what has God said? What has God promised? What has God done in the Son, in His Son on the cross? What promises have God made to my own individual life? And once I grasp hold of that, then the battles that I face look oh so different, don't they? Thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today. Join me next time as we'll continue to talk about this battle between David and Goliath and how the great war was won. Thanks for being a part of this program today. God bless you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.